So when I had a Q&A last weekend, or last Sunday, we had a lot of questions about death and where we go, and um, tried to answer that to the best of my ability here. I stumbled all over my feet, but then when I went home on uh, one Monday night, I actually recorded an answer for that, so you can find that on the church page. But there were also a lot of questions about judgment. About the judgment of the saved and the judgment of the lost. What's the difference and all of the things that are with that. So, although Revelation, as we'll see, has it does say some things about the judgment, the first judgment, um, I think it's a, it's a good place to stop for a second and let's look at what the scripture has to say about it. You know, full of context. We did get to see a little bit about it in Revelation chapter 20. And I'll go back over that tonight. But then I want to show you where it's at in the rest of the New Testament. This may be a two-part or a three-part uh, answer. And if you have questions about this, I'm not trying to go through it so quickly that we'll just run right past it like a marathon. Now, uh, comprehension is more important to me than, than trying to answer every single one of the texts. And I wrote a bunch of them down. If you can read my handwriting here, that has to do with that's not an exhaustive with the judgment seat of Christ. But I'll go slow enough if you want to take notes that you can do that. <clears throat> First of all, I want to start this whole thing with Hebrews chapter 9. You probably have memorized this verse, and if you haven't, maybe you've heard it. And it says this, Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation, without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await it. So we understand from the scripture that there is a judgment coming, but when Christ appears the second time at his second coming, although he's judging the world of sin for those who put their trust in Christ, the judgment there is not in reference to sin. The foundation of that is our understanding of salvation. When we repent and ask Christ for forgiveness and we're born again and regenerated, given new life, all of the wonderful things that happen in salvation, and there's a lot of it at that initial point of salvation, you're not guilty of that sin anymore. Or you're guilty, but the, the judgment has passed over you. It's been placed on Christ. He took our guilt on himself. This was Grimper says that. We're, the, the sin is forgotten. The Lord has 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 cleansed it. So our understanding of the scripture is that at justification, when you are completely born again, you are made new. And your sin is remembered no more. The Lord has placed it as far away from the east as from the west. Is it possible for the God who knows all things to forget? No. He does remember those things, but in Christ, they're covered. They're covered. Were the, were the Israelites in the Exodus who placed the blood on the door and the post and lintel, were they innocent? Not really. Just the blood of the sacrificial lamb covered. And the death angel saw it and it passed over. This whole purpose of Passover. The Passover in the Exodus was a foretelling of what Christ does for us. When we are covered by his blood and we're in his house, so to speak, we are covered by his blood. We're not touched by the second death anymore. <clears throat> so that's one thing we find in the book of Revelation. But sin is not sin is not held against us. It's credited to us as righteousness. We're covered with the righteousness of Christ. We are not righteous in ourselves. We don't have any righteousness that warrants salvation. But when he comes and he judges the world, those who are his, dead in Christ shall rise, the ones who are still living will be changed in a moment. He's not coming in reference to sin. Not for those who have placed their trust in Christ. He'll appear a second time for salvation. It's to save us from the sinful world. And then he does judge the rest of the, li the dead, or the living who don't know Christ. Christ also has a dead offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. It is our hope. I mean, honestly, we can't add anything to salvation. There's nothing that we can do that adds to justification. 
that part of salvation. You can't make yourself more justified by coming to church. You can't make yourself more justified by dressing a certain way or even being baptized. You can't just be justified any more than Christ is already justified because his salvation in justification is complete. It's complete. There's nothing more that you can add to it. The book of Isaiah says that all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags, literally menstrual cloths. So if our righteousness adds nothing but filth to it, then we, God doesn't need our righteousness. There is this, this idea that somehow we have to live out, we have to prove that we're saved somehow through our life. And, and it's through that that uh, <clears throat> somehow we gain this I don't know, out, outward proof. But honestly, you don't know if a person's saved or not. You don't know the condition of somebody's heart. And we'll, we'll see some of this as Paul even writes about this, this issue. The Lord's going to bring all that to light in the very end. Now, I may look at somebody and say, that person's got it going on. They know the Lord. And when I come to that final day and the Lord will say, I never knew you. You were, doing, you were playing religion, but I never really knew you. And we might look at somebody else whose life has been a shambles, and they've been resistant to sanctification in their life, and, and they might know the Lord, but <laughs> they may not have much reward. What I want you to understand is the judgment seat of Christ, this first judgment that happens when Jesus returns to set up his millennial kingdom, the first judgment is not in reference to works as far as like, what you've done to get into heaven. It's, there is a reward aspect, it, where the, aspect of it where the Lord rewards the life that you've lived through sanctification. You can't add anything to justification. It's final. It's complete. You can't do anything to, to add to it. You can't do anything to take away from it. You can't lose it once it's given. You can't you take it away. There's some practical aspects of the sanctification process, however, that do have an effect on rewards. When you stand before Christ and give an account, as we'll find later see, our life will be examined, and all of us will suffer some loss. But I'm getting ahead of myself there. So we die, we live once, we die once, and then after this comes the judgment. Now unfortunately for, for some, there will be a second death. But for those who've been justified by Christ, the second death does not hurt them. We find this in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 reveals, the end of chapter 19 and then the end of 20, it reveals the judgment of Christ on the world when he comes. Babylon falls, Jesus comes riding on a horse, uh, all of the armies of the world that are left gather together. Jesus calls for the birds for a great feast, they eat the flesh of commanders and all of those who are in the armies. And Jesus throws the beast and false prophet into the lake of fire. Then he binds Satan and throws him into the abyss and locks him in it bound. And the world finds peace because Christ is present and Satan is bound. And in chapter 20, verse 4, it says this. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon him. And judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the image or, his, or the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and upon their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And when we went through that passage, I basically said, it doesn't tell us much about this judgment in this passage, other than the fact that these who were martyred and beheaded come back to life, and they reign, we know for sure, that these guys reign with Christ for a thousand years. But the scriptures do tell us more. Just not here in the book of Revelation. Revelation is just kind of showing you an overview of some of these things. The, the, the bulk of the book of Revelation can, can be confined to about a three and a half year period, if not seven years, maybe even more. 
So when it gets to chapter 20, you compress a thousand years into two verses, you know? Two or three verses. And then, you know, it's just like, well, what do we know about that? Well, the scripture speaks elsewhere of those things. While we're in this study, I think it's important for us to realize that the scripture is not silent on this. The way we live matters. Now, though we can't add anything to justification, we sure can do something about our sanctification in practice here. And the life that we live will result in what we receive as re in rewards, or what the scripture talks about is glorification. Now, all of us in glorification get a new body. But in the millennial kingdom, not everybody gets the same reward. Again, Jesus talks a lot about that. There are thrones that are set up. Daniel saw this. He was looking in his visions until the very end, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, there were thrones set up, books were opened. And you get this idea of a courtroom at the very end. And it's a very legal proceeding. And there are things that have to be gone through and dealt with so that Christ can receive his kingdom. And part of that is the review. We're at the end of this section of history and things need to be <coughs> dealt with. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the ancient of days took his seat, chapter 7, verse 9 of Daniel. His vesture was like white snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, and its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing, and coming out from before him, thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the book was opened. Who's standing before him? Granted, you can say it's the angels, but I think there's more to them. I think it's the dead. The dead in Christ. They're attending. They're standing before him. We ask the question, where, where did the dead in Christ go between here and when Jesus returns? Well, we know for sure, that at least, that the martyrs mentioned here in Revelation 20, they're right before the throne of God. In fact, they're hanging out under the altar. But there's every indication that all of the other believers are there too. They're just waiting. Waiting for the better things that God has promised that will come when all of the dead are raised, all of the dead in Christ are raised. So that together we'll receive what has been promised. I, I've seen a meme this week about Abel. <laughs> you know, Abel died. We don't know exactly when he died, but how long was it between Abel's death and the death of somebody else? What was he doing? Of course, they're just kind of making fun of it. Abel's just kind of sitting up there looking out of the window. He's going, you know, it's boring up here all by himself. He doesn't know what to do, and so he's just walking around, you know. But we don't know. We don't know how long Abel was there. And, and that begs a question that I think the answer to is quite simple if we can grasp it. Time is different after we pass this, this plane of this life on this side of heaven. You know, on this side. When we're in the flesh, we mark time by days and hours and all sorts of things. But when we're in the heavenly realm, it's different. It's different. And time here works differently than time does there. We're in time here. We're outside of time there. Well, Daniel was looking. There's an order of events. Even though we're not in the same time frame, time just moves differently, there comes a point in that when thrones are set up and God takes his seat and note, his, flame, his throne is a blazing fire. What was before the throne of God in the heavenly picture in the book of Revelation? It was the altar of incense which was on fire. Fire surrounds the throne of God. Rainbows surround the throne of God. Clear crystal, transparent sea of glass surrounds the throne of God. Angels crying out, holy, 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 surround the throne of God. You get this idea that it's, it's a very solemn place and God is there sitting in the midst of this blazing fire of great glory. Just as God was a pillar of fire by night to the children of Israel in the wilderness, God is sitting in a pillar of fire in heaven, so to speak. He is surrounded by that. He's not concerned. When the thrones are set up, judgment is given. The court sat and the books were opened. 
And at that point, the beast, false prophet, all of that, are thrown into the lake of fire. Dominion is given to Christ. He comes on the clouds. And he receives the kingdom, returns to earth in great power and authority, and judges. And he judgment, and sets up his throne. The souls that are beheaded are rewarded. When we understand that the rest of the dead, this refers to those who don't know Christ, the rest of the dead, they don't come alive again until after the millennial reign. So, when Jesus was telling the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, the dead of both compartments of the underworld, so to speak, in Sheol or Hades, were separated by a great gulf. The unrighteous dead were suffering. The righteous dead were, were, were resting with Abraham. And when Jesus died, he went down, set the captives free, told everybody else what happened, and said, hey, see you on the other side of this, and basically did the victory lap. We won. They're still there. But the dead in Christ, the ones who hoped in God, went with Christ to where he's at. The rest of the dead don't come on. There will be people who die in the millennial kingdom. We understand that there, there are some, not many, not nearly the population that we have in the world today, there are some who will barely make it through the time of great tribulation through the wrath of God, and they will live as normal natural people in the millennial kingdom. The scripture says that if somebody during that time frame dies to be a hundred, people will be like, what happened? You know, a hundred years old will be like a, a child. So it, it's possible that maybe somebody during the millennial reign will even out with Methuselah. We don't know. And there's no indication that Methuselah is actually the longest living man, but he's the longest living man recorded in the scripture. The point is, is there are those who will be naturally born and they're born of flesh and they're flesh and blood uh, during the millennial kingdom because at the very end of it there is another release of Satan for a very short time who goes out to deceive those nations, those peoples. And there could be a hundred million people on the earth at that time, right? It doesn't take very long for mankind to proliferate. Although we look back in history and see a lot of um, projections of people, because we don't know. It's not like we had a census of the entire world. But if you double every 25 to 40 years, it doesn't take very long to continue to double. And next thing we know, you've got millions and millions of people. The Lord knows what he's doing with that. For those who are raised to life again, to those who are... Uh, when Christ comes and we're changed in a twinkling of an eye and we receive a new body or whatever it is, the dead in Christ rise and those who are alive rise and meet them in the air and we're changed in that moment according to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. We reign with Christ for a thousand years. The Bible actually talks about this in Matthew 25. What will we be doing? How does that work out? Will we have positions of power authority? Where will our rewards be? Well, you know, honestly, the Lord knows exactly what He's doing in that. There will be people who will receive great reward, and there'll be people who will, won't receive much at all. Um, but that has to do with what we do here. The dead in Christ will come, not come alive until after the millennial reign, but those who are raised to life will reign with Christ and will be priests of God in Christ for that millennium. We will be God's ambassadors in this world doing ministry to everybody who's here and teaching them to love the Lord. We'll walk with Christ and we'll know Him and it'll be a very unique time unlike anything we've ever experienced. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 Paul discusses more of this. If you guys have any questions in the middle of this Feel free to stop me and I'll write these down or answer them the best I can. Paul says this. And I'll just start with the first part of it. For we need to know that if our earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, if we die, this body dies and decays, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, 
eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, shall not be found naked, we are spirits, we are souls in a body. We're not bodies who have souls and spirits. We're primarily spiritual beings. But God has put us in these bodies that we enjoy this, this life in. And so when the body dies, we truly don't die. It's the body that decays. This body wears out, but the soul goes on. Um, and so that aspect is there. Well, when we die, there's another house, so to speak. There's another place for us. When we put it on, we won't be found there. For indeed, while we're in this tent, we groan being burdened because we don't want to be unclothed, but to be clothed in order that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. I don't have to say much about this because we all know the aches and pains as we get older. This body is groaning. It's crying out. And I think it cries out even more the older we get. And what we think are, you know, I think this is true. As we get older, the more frequent our doctor visits are, right? What is that? Why is that? It's our body that's crying out. Wanting to be clothed with the heavenly body that the Lord has prepared. We have to come to grips with this. This is part of this answer. Do we want to continue here artificially? I, I would say, let's not go on that. I mean, that's up to you. You've got to do what you've got to have to do. And you've got to listen to the word on that. I'm just saying, let's not go find someone to assist us to the other plane. <laughs> no. Accept it with grace as the Lord leads you. The Lord might have you here for 110 years. You know? He might have you here for 70 and that's okay, either one's fine. You might have your guts on that. But when our body starts breaking down, it's our body crying out for the other side. We want to go. Paul said, I, I desire to part. But it's better for me right now, and for you, that I stay and continue on in the flesh. There's going to be profit either way. He's like, but I just really want to go home and be with Jesus. And so your body is really just saying, I just want to go home with nothing wrong with that. Just recognize it for what it is. And praise the Lord that your body recognizes what your spirit and soul is refusing to listen to. <laughs> Maybe it's your soul that's telling your body this. It's time. You know, it's time to, to focus in on other things. Well, now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God. God did this. Why is there decay in our bodies? Who caused that? The sin. Well, the the tree of life was set here. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where it starts at. But who subjected it? God did. See, even after Adam and Eve ate of that tree of life, yeah, their eyes were open. But the Lord's the one that passed the curse on them. The Lord subjected this world and our bodies to this. He says, you're not going to live very long. You're not going to live as long as you once did. You're going to have all of these issues, and it's going to be your body crying out. The one who prepares for this very purpose is God. And for us who believe, he gives us his spirit as a pledge, an earnest of our inheritance. The spirit of God is in us saying, this world is not all there is. There's more beyond us. Focus in on the other, the other side. It's going to be better. This is not everything. Don't save up for everything right here, because this is not all there is. Yeah, it's not all there is. Therefore, all, being always of good courage, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, we're walk by faith, not by sight. We're of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and be home at home with the Lord. And that was part of my answer about where we go when we die. But he's not done with that. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether to be at home or absent, to be pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We want to go home and be with Jesus. But what happens when we leave this place? We will stand before the judgment seat. We individually stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And somebody asks, will, will everybody else see all of my sins played out on a wall before the Lord? <laughs> there's no indication that there's ever going to be a replaying of all of that. 
But what difference does it make if they do? You won't be worried about what they think. You'll be worried about what Christ thinks. Christ's opinion of you is all that's going to matter at that point. And everybody's going to sit there and go, Who that's me. And I can't stand for it because my sin is this. And all of us are going to have that. You know, you can fill up everybody's sin on the wall and it's the same thing. Everybody's struggling with the same thing. We won't be worrying about what everybody else has to say. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we're recompensed for our deeds done in the body according to what we've done, whether good or bad. Now, is that a judgment of whether or not you're saved? If you're standing before the judgment seat of Christ, it's not an issue of whether or not you've been justified. The issue there is what have you done for Christ while you've been in this body? The judgment seat of Christ is not the great white throne judgment. That comes later. The judgment seat of Christ happens at the beginning of the millennial reign. The final judgment, the great white throne, happens at the end. Two very different judgments. Very different judgments. And when the Lord looks at our life, will there be anything? Will there be anything that we can say, the Lord, um, you told me, they're, they're, like, we're not even going to be able to speak back to the Lord. Can you imagine someone trying to give an excuse to God and when God says, why didn't you do what I told you to? All he's going to do is look at us and we're going to just be, you know what I'm saying? I, there's no way to justify any of it. And all of our life, literally, when we stand before the Lord, he's going to look at it. And according to uh, 1 Corinthians 3, the foundation is Christ. What we build upon is there. It's going to be burnt up with the fire of the Lord as he looks at it. And we'll be, that'll be done. I don't think it's this long, drawn-out process. I think, the, I think when we stand before the Lord, it's the fire of God's righteous judgment who, in His holiness, He's going to know, and we're going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. He's going to see His blood covering us for our sins, and He's going to reward for our faithfulness. Did we do what He told us to? I think everybody who's ever lived who's put their faith in Christ, is going to have something burnt up. There won't be anybody who won't go through the fire of God's judgment unsinged, so to speak. But the point of that is not how much you got burnt up. It's the point of that is what was the foundation and anything that was built upon it that was good is to the praise and glory of God. It all comes from Him. From him. He's purifying us through His holiness. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, because of that, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. What are we trying to persuade men about? Live a life of holiness. Just live your life to the glory and honor of God. Like, I don't want anybody to have more of their life burn up. Like, I just want to encourage you to go harder, go stronger, go faster, be more faithful. I don't want to cause a stumbling block. I don't want to be a roadblock. I don't want to push you away and make you mad. I, I want to encourage you to follow Christ so that when you stand before Him, you won't have as much burn up. You know what I'm saying? We're all going to suffer some loss, but I don't want you to suffer as much loss as you could. And, and I don't want to suffer as much loss as I could. You know what I'm saying? Paul says, but we're manifest to God. We persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope we're made manifest in your conscience also. So you know what? God sees. God sees all. And the things that I see on the outside may not tell the whole story. The things that we see when we look at other people do not tell the whole story of what's going on in their life. And we might run across somebody that we look at and go, man, that guy's, that guy's life's all messed up. But he might be walking closer to Jesus than you ever have. And he, he, they might be struggling with something you've never struggled with, or you're not, that's maybe not your particular sin, and you're being more unfaithful than they are, and we just judge on the external appearances. But when we, when we stand before Christ, all of that will go away. There won't be any mistake in judgment, and everything that is true will be revealed for So this really should kind of 
put a uh, different perspective on the way that we look at things. If this man, the reference that Because we'll stand before the Lord, um, we'll get to that one here in just a second. When we have our uh, time before the Lord, what's left is something that, I mean, what can we do with it? Say, Lord, here, Lord, to the praise and honor of God, you saved me, you're the foundation, Lord, you built this upon my life. It's to your praise and glory. It's not so that we can boast. It's so that the Lord receives the glory and the honor and praise. 